This week's Hot Topic, we take a look at the business of medicine and how practitioners are having challenges providing quality care for their patients. Joining us this week is Dr. Charlie Rhodes with the Cabarrus Family Medicine Practice and President of the North Carolina Academy of Family Physicians, and Dr. Richard Brook, who's with Emerge Ortho and is Chair of the Board of the North Carolina Specialty Hospital and a doctor to the North Carolina's own Durham Bowles. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Dr. Thank Brooke, you. why don't you start? Tell us a little bit about some of the challenges faced providing care for your patients in today's medical regulatory environment. Thank you very much, Joe. It it's, uh, breaks down in my mind into three issues. If we're trying to make great care available to our patients at a lower cost point, something's got to change. An example would be certificate of need where we have about the lowest penetration of ambulatory surgery centers in the country. Here in what, North Carolina. Yes, so the difference, what's the difference? By Blue Cross's own cost estimator on the website, you can have your rotator cuff fixed at Carolina's Health System in Charlotte for $30,000 on an outpatient basis, or in the same metropolitan area, you can have it fixed at a surgery center for less than $10,000. That's a 300% difference for the same procedure. It's just a site of service. So it would take 70 more, 70, 70 more surgery centers to get to the national average in North Carolina. That's hurting all of us. What needs to change to address that issue? Likely it has to be legislative change. Currently, the state medical facilities plan, that's a complicated document has no need formula in the certificate of need process for ambulatory surgery centers. So we don't even hardly recognize them. Yes. So Dr. Brook, do, do you, I'm, I'm, I'm a little confused here. So do you not want all these 25 or 26 regulations that are under the current CON laws? Or are you saying that some of them needs to be stripped out while others can be kept? I think the biggest change would be to strip out just a few of them to start, and ambulatory surgery is huge. Another is imaging. You could be a group of doctors who want to purchase an MRI unit. Let's say you want to purchase it for one dollar, and you had the best radiologist to read those studies in the country. You can't do it in North Carolina because there is no need. And the amount of monies that are paid to the health system-based or hospital-based imaging studies are way much more than paid to the independent physician's office. Well, Dr. The Rhodes same is, study, oftentimes read by the same radiologist, but the cost is more. Well, Dr. Rhodes, as a family doctor, you maybe see things in a different way. What are some of the challenges you face in providing quality care? Well, I, I think Dr. Brooke is right. I mean, one of the issues we have is cost because cost is not transparent in many cases. and. It's an interesting situation where you walk in, you don't know how much something's going to cost you until you get home and get a bill. And that's one of the things that the Affordable Care Act was trying to change, and I, I think that still needs to change. But exactly what he's saying, if you get the same procedure done in different facilities, it, it'll cost a different amount of money. And so I think that's really something that, that needs to be looked at. The, the underlying theme on this is the overwhelming burden of administrative oversight that physicians have to deal with these days. I mean, the, the ACA was a great idea, but it brought a lot of paperwork into our offices. And, and what is being proposed now at the ACHA is different, uh, but we still see a lot of administrative oversight in that. And the burden is such that it's forcing many private physicians to join the large hospital systems because they just don't have the administrative help to do all the extra paperwork we're talking about pre-certifications for surgeries if that's what they need, uh, different formularies, so if I prescribe a medication for you and you change your insurance, I have to go back and re-prescribe another medication because that insurance company doesn't carry that one. Uh, all sorts of different things that we have to have people do for us. There's a, a statistic from the Harvard Business Review said that the healthcare workforce grew by 75% from 1990 to 2012. 95% of that growth though was in new hires that weren't providing care. Every physician now has to have about 16 other workers to support him. Out of those 16, 10 of those provide administrative functions. Only six are provided in actual patient care. So Dr. Rhodes and uh, Dr. Brooke, um, 
we we have heard this right and i want to sort of get get your take on this that when you talk about healthcare cost a majority of the cost i, uh, I believe it's mainly tied to medicare costs is tied to the last 5 years end of life care is that is that correct that is correct okay, okay. so in, if we are going to address the issue of reducing cost how do we leave that portion out which is of course, nobody wants to talk about. You're exactly right that nobody wants to have death panels or the federal government involved in deciding who gets care or what, how the care is delivered and what setting. And I strongly believe that we need to have the care between the doctor and the patient. And there are a bunch of other ways to save money without dealing with the end of life crisis. What, what, what would they be? Name me, name me a couple that we should attack first. <clears throat> Pay for value, okay? That is getting the right care for our patients in the right sitting with a nice happy outcome and everybody's happy. And we can't do it under our current system in North Carolina with Why a certificate not? of need blocking alternative pathways. It's the CON laws. CON laws. Mm -hmm. And then when you try and do the pay for value, I'm going to give you an example of a federal voluntary program, the Bundle Payments for Care and Improvement Initiative. That's called BPCI. That's one of the few programs open to specialist physicians, and I'm orthopedics, bone and joints. So my practice signed up for that program expecting that if they made better care for the patient and lowered the costs, that we'd get some of the cost sharing. And I'll give you just a couple examples. Starting January 1, 2015, that's a year and a half ago, we've saved Medicare 31 percent. Okay? We've saved almost $2,800 for every patient in that program for Medicare. That saved the Medicare and the taxpayers. Here's how the, the money saved went. Twelve and a half million dollars. CMS distributed one million to the doctors and kept the other eleven million for themselves. Okay? Now when you say they kept now, it for themselves, what does that mean? That means they kept it for themselves. There's a lot of funny stuff that goes on in these programs, what I'm going to call opaque calculations that the doctors can't figure it out in CMS. They have an innovation center, won't tell you how it's figured out. Emerge Ortho is under a deadline of June 23, that's next week, to decide to leave this program and get forgiven debt of $2.4 million or to stay in this program and pay the feds $2.4 million after we've already saved them over $11 million. There are things that just don't add up. Emerge Ortho has 11 employees who do case management care. Non-physicians. Non-physicians. They work with the patients, 45-minute interview, figure out the medicines, where they want to go afterwards, how they're going to get things taken care of. It's a great program. Every metric for quality we have improved dramatically yet it doesn't work out. That's an idea of the frustrations in the program. So what, 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 what will Emerge Ortho do? What are you going to do? <laughs> we have been advocating and working with folks both in the state and nationally and hope to have some relief, okay? I'm very happy to say that North Carolina Secretary of Health and Human Services Mandy Cohn, she's a physician, came from CMS, has been very much helpful. Mr. Bob Seligson from the North Carolina Medical Society, very helpful. We've had good interaction from our senators, Tom Tillis and Richard Burr, but we're dealing with the federal system and it's all different. So that's one of the things. Emerge Ortho was four different practices that joined together on the state to achieve the economies of scale to be able to have the administrative efforts. Got it. But we, we're spending a million dollars a year on 11 employees who might get laid off 
if we have to drop the program. Dr. Reds, let me ask you a practical question. You talked about the ACA, the Affordable Care Act, and now Congress is debating a new version of that. Repeal and replace is an expression used. There are contained within the Affordable Care Act many mandates, some discussion in Congress of, of doing away with those mandates, but still a significant cost driver in medicine are eminently preventable disorders that are associated with lifestyle choices people make, weight, heart disease, diabetes, those sorts of conditions. What are you finding is successful with your own practice with the patients you see to try to convince them to live healthier lives so that their health expenses can be less? So as Dr. Brooke mentioned, the, the uh, direction that medicine is going in right now is towards value-based care versus just episodic, uh, what we call RVU, relative value unit driven care where you get paid for just seeing a patient. The uh, future payment models that are proposed under ACA and also under ACHA include population management. And that means that a physician becomes responsible for a panel of patients, which will be somewhere around three to 4,000 people, and their general health will be, be the task of that person, which includes talking to them about keeping their weight under control, stopping smoking, lead, leading much healthier lifestyles than what they're doing right now. The, the concept that medicine's working towards is team care, and that's really where we need to be going with this thing, is to, it's not just the physician, it's the entire team, which includes mid-level providers and, and physical therapists and lab workers and other people like that to help take care of the patient the best they can. And I think your question is how do we motivate people to do things like that? I don't know. I mean, I have my own opinion. Some of them have been very, very successful. Some have not been successful. Um, but I think that's, you know, again, when we, when we make the physicians responsible, not just for the 10 minutes they're in the office with the patient, but for the, the entire day or lifespan of the patient, which is what we do. We take care of people from birth until the end of life. That's family medicine. Uh, and we, you know, we're the only specialty that has a footprint in all counties in this, in this state. And we have still 30% of our doctors are independent, not owned by the large system. So we have a, um, a deep interest in the communities that we live in. I've been in Mount Pleasant for 30 years, a town of 1,600 people. Uh, you know, I've, I know many of the people. I delivered one of the nurses that works with me. So, you know, it's, that's what we do. And so that's, that's where we need to start moving medicine in general. Dr. Rhodes, Dr. Brooke, thank you so much for being us, uh, with us on this week's uh, Bottom Line.